name is uh, Thomas Royakers. I am uh, currently based in uh, Dornbirn in uh, Austria. I'm a basketball coach for uh, the Dornbirn Lions. And uh, yeah, we actually finished our season last month. So currently just doing some practices with the team right now. I grew up in uh, Deurne, which is a city in the North Brabant in uh, the Netherlands. Um, I was always active with uh, sports, played many sports, like I think a lot of children in uh, the Netherlands do, you know, played soccer, basketball, tried out different sports. Um, then I played, started playing basketball actually for the second time pretty late. I started when I was 11 or 12. Um, but at some point I knew that when I got to the senior level that I was going to be an okay player. Maybe I could have played at the first division level, but I was never going to be a really good player. Uh, so I decided really early on to go into coaching. Actually, it was a good transition uh, because I started really early with coaching uh, youth teams. And that was at the time that I was still playing myself. So uh, that was very difficult uh, at times. Uh, I remember uh, where I coached a team in uh, Nijmegen, which is a city in the east. And I was playing at that time in Belgium. So I would have to coach a game, then drive two hours quickly to Belgium just to be on time there for the game, which is really, really difficult. And then, you know, practicing in different locations in different countries at that time actually made the, you know, the transition pretty smooth for me to just go into coaching. And uh, I also uh, attended a special sports school for uh, coaches. So the transition for me was actually smooth and it was good that I could just focus on one thing and uh, do that really good. Ever since I uh, also played, I always found it interesting to work and help uh, with uh, young players um, to help them to improve the, the process you know of getting better has always intrigued me um, it's very important um, I think the youth is you know the future of uh, basically everything so it's very important that they get good guidance um, of course um, now it is uh, I'm coaching uh, senior teams for the past years so I'm also working uh, with a lot of uh, experienced players, sometimes even older uh, than me, which again gives me a chance uh, to learn. So uh, it's, it's you know, a great way to, first of all, learn yourself. And then second of all, to pass along, you know, all the information and all the experience you have to younger players. There's many, but I think uh, you have to uh, stimulate them. Um, I think... You have to be tough on them, uh, but um, keep it fair, right? So be, be tough, but with fairness. Um, you have to be very patient with them because young players, obviously, they're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's part of, you know, uh, the process. Um, you have to give them confidence. Uh, although I'm not really sure if that's the right thing to say, give them confidence. They have to, to, you know, get confident themselves. And I believe they do that by a lot of repetitions, by practice and by experience success, success. And that's going to take a long time also. Um, and I think an important thing is also that players uh, make decisions themselves. So you want to develop individuals that, you know, can make their own decisions. Uh, a lot of times I see coaches over coaching players where they basically tell them to pass and to shoot uh, during the game, which I think if you do a good job, then players will make those decisions themselves, which is ultimately what we are looking for, I think. The most important thing for motivation is that there's internal motivation, especially for young players, right? I mean, as you get older, sometimes there can be ex external motivation uh, in terms of money or in terms of, you know, being able to do it as a job. But for youth, it has to be internal motivation and it has to be very, uh, very high um, because, you know, you are, let's, I don't know when players start, but when they start early and you're going to have to probably play about 10 years as a youth player. And that's a long and tough process. Um, 
So I think the most important thing is that players have a very strong will and that they're tough. Uh, talent, of course, can help in basketball. Height and physical skills can help. But I think you have to be very tough, very disciplined in order you know, to get the most out of yourself. I think uh, parents should mainly be supportive. Um, of course, players are going to come home and, you know, after a bad day or a bad practice, you know, coach has done a terrible job of maybe they haven't played. So they should always be, you know, ha um, giving them a listening ear. Uh, try to be, um, how do I say that? You know, you always want to be supportive to your child, but also keep it in perspective. Um, so I think the worst thing that parents can do is, you know, when players don't play is start talking to coaches. Um, I would suggest if, you know, there's a problem or a situation that they would stimulate the player to talk to the coach themselves, because ultimately later on in life, when you have a job, your parent is not going to go to your boss uh, to solve the problem for you. And that's their job. And I think the earlier they learn that, the better. Um, that's tough for parents, of course, because you never want to see your child suffer. Um, it's, it's tough when they don't play. But I think, you know, again, the most important thing is that you are supportive and that you have an open line of communication. Also for me as a coach, especially with youth, I started coaching uh, a under 16 team that was the first team that I coached and I think like most coaches you know you start at a youth age and then slowly you move up you know under 18 I coach the nationals uh, there and at some moment I got a chance to start my professional career uh, which was in Rotterdam for a basketball academy uh, so that was my first year coaching professional I was coaching again youth teams and at some moment you're like, okay, I was, I was, I needed more of a challenge. So then three, la three years later, I got an opportunity to work in the first division as an assistant coach, men, and at the same time to be the head coach as an under 20, for the under 20s in uh, Den Helder. So it kind of came along on my path. And ever since then, I have been uh, either been a head coach for senior teams or at the same time, uh, uh, been the assistant coach for a first division team and then coaching the under 20 uh, from that club so I think uh, first of all nowadays for youth uh, you have to be very clear you have to be very you have to explain everything because the, the when I was uh, young and a player I just did what my coach told me to right I didn't ask I didn't it's not that I didn't care about what we were doing. It's just what the coach says you do is, is like that. So uh, that's not the, the situation anymore. Um, you have to be very explanatory to the players. Say, this is why we're doing things. It's uh, not a bad thing because, of course, when players understand what they're doing, they're more likely to buy in, which is very important. As a coach, you need to buy in from your players. Even more when you get the senior teams, then they really need to buy in. They need to believe in that you know your stuff. Uh, they need to believe in the things that you are doing, that they work. Um, at the youth level, you know, it, it's easier because they don't have that experience yet. But at uh, the senior team, like I said, there's players. I've coached players that uh, have played in the EuroLeague, which is the top level in Europe. Then you better know what you're doing because they will find out really quickly uh, if you know what you're talking about or not. And uh, once, if you have lost the trust from those players, it's very difficult to get it back. Um, so you have to be consequent with them. Uh, you have to set, you know, the tone from the beginning and you have to be very clear on what is allowed and what is not. But overall, I've had very good experiences. Uh, you know, like I said earlier on, you can really learn from those players. Um, most important there is you have an open line of communication with those players and that you also respect them and a lot of times they appreciate that and the respect will come back to you i have built mine with you know working throughout the years in basketball and i must tell you it's it's like a human being it's life so it constantly changes because i'm still seeing new things every day so i might adapt a little bit but in, in general you know the philosophy stays uh, the same so 
I, I have a couple of points which you know uh, I always use. Uh, the first point for me is uh, to work with a high level of standards. Uh, has nothing to do with basketball, but I think for me it's the most important because it doesn't really matter what your tactics are or or you know it's what matters is how you do things. So we try to do things with great intensity, with paying attention to detail, um, that kind of stuff. And if you have a really good tactical set, but your players are not executing at the right speed or pace, and not having the right spacing, you're not paying attention to details, it will never be as good. So therefore, I always tell my players that, you know, we're trying to work with a high level of standards. And that's both on and off the court. That's in the video room. That's when we're lifting weights. So just really try to keep uphold a high level of standards. Mm -hmm. Then um, rebounding for me is a very big part. Um, why? Because it's directly linked to uh, possessions. And the more possessions, obviously, you get in basketball, the bigger chances of you winning the game. So I have the philosophy with going with three to the offensive rebound, um, two in transition defense. There's coaches who do that differently which is also okay, but um, in the past, you know, and I have the stats also to prove that is that at least my teams were either number one or number two in the league in rebounding in both total rebounds and offensive rebounds. So I know at least what I'm doing there is working. Um, then on offense is, sorry, on defense, we want to play hard and smart. Uh, that's the total idea. You know, of course, you're, you want your team to be really intense and to be really aggressive because I think that gets the opponent out of their comfort zone, which I think is a key point to get the opponent out of their comfort zone and make them do something else than they really want to do. And therefore, you have to be very aggressive. At the same time, you want to still play smart because if you are only going to be that hardworking team, but you don't make the right decisions, you're going to be you're going to be OK, but you're not going to be great. And I want to be, you know, getting the most out of my team. So the philosophy on defense is to play hard and smart. At the same time, the philosophy on offense is to basically create an advantage and then to use that advantage, right? So it's not going to benefit you a lot if you create an advantage and then don't use it. So we try to create advantages in transition offense, which is the fast break early, uh, early on. And also other situations like sprinting ball screens, you know, creating outnumbered situations. That's basically the idea on offense. Um, and then the other thing is that we try to limit our turnovers. So the turnover is, you know, uh, an empty possession. The more you have of those, the diff more difficult it is, of course, to win the game. So that kind of sums up my philosophy. Of course, you know, you have your, your tactics, um, but th this is the main yeah, the main philosophy of uh, what my teams always work with. Well, this year, obviously, it was to work in the, in the situation with the COVID, which I think a lot of teams uh, have experienced. Uh, let's just say, you know, it was it was a very difficult situation because everything was different. It can be different from day to day. Um, one day you have a lot of players in practice, the next day you don't because of people that have to get tested and they test positive, uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, I was fortunate enough with my team that we didn't get any positive tests throughout a five-month period, which is actually, a, yeah, I think that's pretty exceptional. So the players that really do a good job of protecting themselves. Um but it, it was very different. And that started in the preseason. So Dornbirn is a city in the, the, in the west of uh, Austria. We are very close to Germany. But I remember we had games scheduled against German teams. But because of the situation with Corona, sometimes we had to cancel that game because we were not allowed to travel. Uh, then the next week, we could schedule it again. So it was very difficult just to get through uh, preseason, it was difficult to get even games in this situation because uh, governments and everything, is they're closing things down. And um, it was just difficult to get things going. Now, once the season got going, we were, we were okay. Um, 
And then the problem here in Austria for my team is that we had a lockdown, a really hard lockdown. And a lot of players from my team, actually eight players from my team decided to stop, which basically was the whole team. I had uh, two players left for my senior team with a lot of youth players. Uh, and from that moment on, of course, the drop off in, in level was tremendous. Um, I must give credit to the guys that stayed and, and to the youth players because we never gave up. Um, but of course, it was difficult to replace eight players. We were never really able to recover from that. And we got some players towards the middle and the end of the season. We added three uh, guys, but you know, it's still minus five if you calculate the whole thing. So the most challenging thing was to deal with that. I had an idea, of course, on tactics and how we did that. And I was busy with that the whole summer. And after five games, basically, yeah, the whole team was different. And we had to really start from zero. Um, we preseason. So basically, you have to start, yeah all over um, and what it also made difficult is because we didn't have the numbers anymore in practice, you know, in basketball, you need minimum 10 players in practice so you can practice five on five. On very rare occasions, we had that. So we practiced yeah, sometimes with six guys, um, which is okay for players. But if you do that too many times, you know, your, your five on five game is really suffering because everything is different with spacing and timing and that kind of stuff. Um, so every time we got to a game, which was also very challenging for the players, is like it was a new situation for us because we were never able to practice really anymore um, five on five because we just didn't have the amount of players in practice. So I think that was the biggest challenges, challenge. Uh, again, I got to give credit to my players as they never give up uh, all the way to the end of the season. At the, the last four games, we were able to win two, which was really good for us. Um, so that shows their character and uh, I think the hard work uh, paid off what they did the whole season. They, those guys were not professional, so they all had jobs and some of them had um, a little, if I say it correctly, a fear of possibly getting fired uh, from their job if they would uh, get COVID during getting basketball, right? Um, so I know that was that was part of it. Um, the other other things I'm not really sure of, um, but I have to respect that decision. And, uh, you know, I worked with the players that stayed. So, no, I would say I would, I deal with that much better than I did when I was younger. At the same time, I, uh, I still think that I still have to work on that. Um, you know, you want to keep your emotions in check as much as possible. Although sometimes it's also uh, uh, good to be a little bit more emotional, I'm not going to say out of control because out of control is never good. Um, but a very smart coach, uh, Moncho Lopez uh, from FC Porto, I was with him for two weeks and he told me once, if the team is soft, the coach has to be hard. So if your team at some moments, you know, you can, you can flare up a little bit like you would say. And if the team is playing hard, then the coach can be rela more relaxed. And that's, of course, uh, when your team is playing well, you don't really need to, you know, stimulate them probably that much as you sometimes need to when they're not playing well. Now, there's different ways, of course, of stimulating your team. That can be, you know, with, you know, somebody needs a pat on the back. Uh, the other guy maybe needs a little, hey, a wake-up call, right? So that can be in, in different ways. But in general, I would say emotions is a good thing because that means at least you care. Right. If you don't show any emotion, um, I'm not. Yeah. Then that doesn't mean that you don't care. But I think it's always good to show a little bit of an emotion. It's just making sure that you have them in check and that you never get out of control. It's probably one of the most frustrating uh, things as a coach. You know, you have a, you have different types of players. You have the players that work very hard. Always but are not very talented coaches, although maybe they not might not be the most talented players. They always like to work with them because, you know, they work hard. Usually they don't cause any problems. Then you have the players that are 
talented, but they don't work hard, which is always, for, at least for me, I should say difficult to work with because, you know, you see that they have potential, but they don't work hard for whatever reason. And then you have who both work hard and have talent. Of course, those are the players that will ultimately get the most out of themselves, right? So the, the, the goal is for, I think, a coach or at least to help those players in the, in the middle range, like the, the, the not so motivated players, but talented players to, to, to inspire them to become more motivated because they have, you know, potential, but if they don't work on that, and that's why I said, you know, players, especially young guys, they need to, to have a really high work ethic. They need to be tough because ultimately they will just be what we call a talent, but they never really develop their talent. So I think there lies a lot of, a lot of times probably individual talks with players. That doesn't need to mean that you need to go to the office with them and sit them down. No, that can be just one or two minutes on the court, just a little stimulation. Um, sometimes you need to challenge them, right? Um, and I think if you do a good job with them, with that when, you, when they're younger, hopefully it will become a habit for them by the time they get a little bit older and that they understand. That's another thing, of course, players have to understand. A lot of times young players don't understand um, they have to understand that that's important if they want to really, you know, prolong their career as a basketball player. So I would say challenge, you know, the, the young players and make them understand why that is so important for them. Work ethic and discipline. Probably those two things are the most important. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like powerless. You have to understand as a, as a coach, there's a lot of things that you cannot control, right? So let's take a, Let's say practice. The players are sick. Yeah. yeah, you can't control that they're sick. So you, yeah, try, I try not to then worry about it because it only aggravates you, right? So I work and I focus on the guys that are there. Same thing in the game. The the referees, they're there, but I try to ignore them as much as possible because you have no influence uh, on them. But so, to going back to your question, like. Um, you try to motivate them, you try to stimulate them and either at some point they get it or they don't. All right. And if they get it good, you know, uh, you, you might have succeeded, you know, stimulating them. Um, and if not, I'm also OK with that, because ultimately I understand that it, it's depending on the player itself. Right. If if you're constantly pushing and pulling right and the player doesn't want to it's like pulling a dead horse it's not going to work anyways so that doesn't mean if you try one time and he doesn't do it or he fails to do it that you stop no you need to consistently you know try for a very long period of time have a lot of talks with him but at some moment you just got to cut them loose if you know they don't want to or if they can't right so um again that's a long process it's difficult sometimes but you have to be very patient with them. You have to stimulate them. But you have to accept that if they don't want it, they will never get to where you white might think they can get to. Because ultimately, it's it's the player's decision to go there or not. Yeah, for me, burning out is uh, maybe a little different def definition. Um, but I think you can easily do that, right? There is nothing easier probably especially on young kids to hammer things down on them and to be very tough and to not work with them and constantly punish them if they do one thing wrong. And, and if you consistently do that on a, on a yeah, um, if you consistently do that with them, they might get demotivated. That's why I would say more like demotivated and disconnected. Um, but that's not your job, obviously, as a coach. Um, it is your challenge to stimulate them and to help them with mistakes, because ultimately mistakes is part of the learning process. Um, I think that's that's the most important thing. Um, as you get older, of course, players are able to handle more. And as as you know, the higher level you go, a lot of times they just have to suck it up, right? But still, then you still want to work a, a positive working environment because ultimately you know if your players are really wor um, wanting to work for you you'll be in much better state than you're just it's you against the team that is never a good situation so um 
is that is that possible yeah it is but i don't see any benefit from for anybody for that probably by trial and error right everybody is different um i always have uh, individual meetings with players you know we talk about their goals um what they want to do uh, sometimes i even ask them hey what wh how do you prefer me to work with you right so and they can give me an answer because everybody is different um, I think the most important thing is that you know your players. So know what button, buttons to push. You can't be tough on guy A the same way as you are on, on, on player B. Um, you know, different home situations also sometimes require a different approach. So I think you should really know the players and not, not, made, not only the players, but know the person, right? Know what's going on in their personal life, which um, is very important. Um you know, so so get to know the player before you really start working with them and start pushing them. Yeah, I think it's different for everyone, right? Uh, every player has different challenges. Sometimes it can be physical. Sometimes it can be mental. I've had young guys who were 16 that practice and play against men who are over 30. So they obviously have very different challenges than a 33 year old vet right that um yeah that is basically looking at the end of his career so i i can't answer that question for you because it's very very i i can assume it's very different well i think in the short term is obviously to recover from COVID. um i hope that uh, uh you know everything will go well next year although i have no idea how that's really gonna go uh, i assume that with you know what I've been hearing and reading is that a lot of businesses, of course, are struggling. People are struggling, and in sports, you know, we are depending on businesses being sponsors. And I think one of the first things that companies do, if they don't have money to spend anymore or not much to spend anymore, they will cut the sponsorship, which ultimately then you know reflects on sports. So. I think in the short term, you know, recover from this situation, build a solid base. Um, in the long term, you know, I, I think basketball has, has is always changing. There's especially now with you know the new um, how do you say that like the tech, um, um, new new uh, computer stuff. I'm looking for the word here. Sorry. Uh, but there's constantly things being reinvented. Um, so I think I'm not sure where it's going to go. I'm pretty sure that, you know, basketball, there's a lot of developments. So I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of things will be de will de uh, developed in the next years. But um, to see where it's going to go, I'm not really sure. I try to follow uh, some really good coaches in Europe that I'm in contact with. And I see them doing some new things, but that's mainly on a tactical base. Um so it will actually be interesting to see where this is going to go. I have the goal to just be, you know, as good as I can be, whatever that means. I don't set a goal in terms of uh, where I have to be, because, again, there's this is depending on so many factors uh, where you will be next year. Um, I would love to, at one point, coach a team that is playing in a European competition and even better if we we qualified in the year before to earn that comp uh, to earn a spot in that competition, so ultimately that will be a goal of mine wherever that is. Um, I've been very fortunate enough to coach for the past twenty years as a professional in in many different countries and different continents. So I just hope to continue to be able to coach and work with people, and uh, wherever I go, I'll I'll give you know my best. How do I want to be noticed? I mean, that's probably, you know, the way that I am um, is that I am tough on players, uh, which is not always the most liked. Um, but I think that's a way of getting the most out of them. I think at the end, when they begin become older, and this is where I have also some talks with players that I'm still in contact with, that they first struggled with me, um, but they understood at some point why, you know, uh, they did that and they were thankful for that. So tough at the same fair. Uh, you have to be fair to people, be respectful to people. 
Um, and ultimately, I want to be, you know, helping them in order that they can have the best careers that they can have. And in terms of like leaving a legacy, I mean, I'm not really busy with that, honestly. I just try to do as good of a job today as I can. And if there's a legacy, nice. If not, I'm also not bothered by it. So this is absolutely not, not, not a goal or something that I'm busy with. My proudest moment probably was when I was coaching in Germany and I won the championship in second division. And um, that's the time I was still coaching women. Uh, and in the next year, we succeeded to play in the first division and then went to the, uh, how do you say that? We, get, we got into the playoffs, the sixth spot out of 12 teams, which no team has ever done in the last 10 years uh, because normally the, the team that moved up, usually because the difference is so big between first and second division, they would move down immediately. The other team that moved up actually did do that. So that was a great accomplishment and we were in the final four of the cup. So that was that was definitely one of the most proudest moments I've had. Let's just say another maybe very proud moment. I, you probably don't know this, but um, I used to coach for a team... Um, uh, Charleroi. I think like 12 years ago, I watched them play Real Madrid in the EuroLeague and they actually beat that team. So no way, of course, was I even thinking about, you know, coaching for a team like that because that would be just, you know, outrageous to even think something like that. But like I said, some things happened and, and you, you a lot of times you don't have control over that. And I was coaching for that team with a great friend of mine, uh, Brian Lynch. He asked me to join the coaching staff and yeah, to be able to, to, you know, be part of that culture, that winning culture. It really also gives you, you know, a sense of pride and, you know, it really makes you happy about the things that you did before and, and to the stage that, that you were able to, to coach at there. So that was definitely two proudest moments of my life. You know, the way that I was coaching uh, um, or regret, you know, it's just the way it is. And uh, you try to do better. Um, I probably... Um, when I was younger, I would probably do everything different right now, which I think is also normal because you are getting better, you're learning things, right? So, but I would definitely say be more patient. Yeah, uh, that's definitely something that I think, especially young uh, coaches are struggling with because you know you're hungry, you want to get things done as quickly as possible. Um, so that would be probably something that uh, I would say if there's one thing that it probably would be that. Yeah. To be patient, that's one. Um, and maybe not so much for myself, but for anyone who wants to go into coaching, try to play as long as you can at the highest level you can, because it can help you, not that it will, but it can help you uh, open doors, which sometimes for me are closed because I just don't have the contacts. Right. So if you play, let's say, at a first division level for many years and you're a pretty to decent player, um, then I think you have more opportunities. And therefore, I would uh, advise anybody who wants to go into coaching to play as long as possible and use, you know, that that stepping stone. Uh, it can be, you know, uh, opening doors for you, but it also at the time, at the same time, gives you different opportunities to learn from coaches and already think about what is it that I would like to, you know, implement in my philosophy as a coach? Well, I mean, as a player, it was, uh, I grew up in the Jordan era. So there's no bigger inspiration, obviously, than uh, Jordan. Nowadays, you know, it's very simple for, for people to watch uh, games. Uh, then it was, you know, NBA was not on online. Uh, it, there was no internet. Um, so you don't really, you didn't really know how to watch them. I watched him on video VHS, right? There was not even uh, DVDs at that time. So, and then you just try to look at some things from uh, whenever you saw him and then you go to the court and you try to imitate him, right? That's, I think that's what a lot of guys do. Um, as a coach, I have many different coaches that I look at and that I'm in good relationship with, um, uh, and, and, you know, they teach me a lot of things. And the great thing about those guys is working at the highest level uh, possible, even in EuroLeague. They're open to communication with you. They're open to share. They give you your ideas. They give you your thoughts, 
which I'm uh, I'm very appreciative of. So there's there's many guys there that uh, I'm in contact with and and um, yeah, very much appreciate the relationship that I have and the willingness that they have to share information with me. I recently watched a movie which I think uh, ranks pretty high uh, uh, for me. It's actually not a basketball movie. It's about uh, Molly Bloom, um, who is a, a female who ran uh, poker games, uh, underground poker games, which was very interesting. I actually bought the book after seeing that movie and read it. So she's that that movie is pretty high on uh, the all time list uh, for me. I would say. I actually don't have one favorite song that I listen to. I like to, for me, it's the variation that makes uh, uh, things nice. I think also if you listen to your favorite song 10 times a day, it's going to get boring also really fast. So for me, it's more the variation than, than just picking one song. Dogs, for sure. Hot. I'll probably say soccer because you can play 90 minutes and nobody, you know, score a goal and then there will be no overtime. You would just play with the zero zero. So I, that would, for me at least, you know, be, it will be boring, at least for a spectator for me. You know what? I'm actually uh, pretty satisfied with myself uh, right now. Uh, so I don't need any uh, superpowers. I'm I'm good the way I am. Some people may might think me as a different animal, right? I, I'm not really sure. Um, it's a good question, but I think I think they're also different animals have different characteristics, and I would probably then prefer to make some kind of mix of animals, which maybe has not existed so far. So. I wouldn't change my name, not at all. I actually was going to say that I'm pretty grown up right now, but you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, I want to be, uh, you know, someone uh, uh, that supports other people and that helps other people. And uh, I think that's for me uh, very important. Be a good friend, be a good family member. You know, um, I'm not a big reader. But I would suggest people that they read books on various topics, uh, something I also do. I like to read basketball books, obviously, but, um, you know, I read a book from uh, Carol S. Dweck, which is a psychologist uh, from the USA. Um, book is, is about growth mindset, growth and fixed mindset. I think it's a very interesting book for not only coaches, but teachers, uh, people in general, and talks about the mindset of people, how you can get the most out of yourself. It's very easy, uh, readable. Um, and, and yeah, just look at different uh, books. Uh, I also read books about mobility. Um, so read things in your, how do you say that, in your sport and the stuff that you like, but sometimes also go a little bit out of your comfort zone and try to educate yourself beyond what you are daily busy with, because that can really, yeah, how do you say that, uh, gives you a, a bigger perspective on everything. So I think definitely uh, try to read because obviously knowledge is power. And the more you know, the more you can share with your players and other people and, and never be satisfied with where you are right now. So always continue to learn. You know, I always want my players to have a growth mindset, but that goes for me as well. Uh, I want to continue to learn. I want to get better. Um, in many different areas. So read books and, you know, continue to work on yourself.